Are you worried about the future? Turns out, you should be. Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Helmer. Now, guess what? Learning Learning is cool. cool. Learning is cool. Learning people are people people, so it will be a matter of intimate concern to listeners and viewers of this podcast how their people are likely to cope as new technology impacts working lives. To give you some idea of what's coming down the track, we thought we'd get in a real-life professional imagineer, someone involved in the field of digital anthropology, which studies human-computer interaction. Kate Fitzgerald, Head of Fact, tell us about him. Back facts. Esri Kalabak is a consultant, writer, and lecturer who has held senior communications roles in the corporate, public, and non-profit sectors, a fellow of both the Institute of Internal Communication and the Royal Society of Arts. Esri is also thematic lead for AI and emerging technology at the Royal Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland. As for the rest, well, he tells you about that in the interview. If I didn't know you better, John, I'd think you were trying to do me out of a job. Yes, Esri has an amazing CV with a fair few surprises in it. But what else did we talk about? Jay Curtis, Head of Themes, tell us, do. Well, you went all over the map, didn't you? AI, COVID, hybrid work, Elon Musk genetically engineering babies on the moon. But the core of it was Esri's three themes of intelligence, autonomy and morality, and the vital importance of imagination. Esri had good and bad news about the future. The bad news is that if you're already worried about the impact of technological change on humanity, there's a whole lot more to worry about you probably don't even know about yet. The good news is in imagination. We imagined our way into the world we're living in now, says Esri. So though there are undoubtedly troubles ahead, we may well have the power to imagine our way out of them. So welcome to the podcast, Esri Kollerbach. Your background's in communications, but a lot of your work has been in education and training. And of course, comms and learning lie very close together now. Perhaps up to 50% of the L&D remit is comms, if the truth be known. So could you briefly describe your field of expertise and the sort of things you write and talk about? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I, I sort of hesitate to use the term expertise. It's, it always sounds so grand. What I describe myself as is a connector. I'm good at making connections between ideas, between people, between places, and among all those different things. Um, and, and I enjoy very much making the connections in the most eclectic manner possible, including through various learning settings, either in individual institutions or through uh, agencies and associations related to learning. But the things that I write about, um, although they have often very different headings uh, and titles, they have three underlying themes that I think um, inform pretty much all that I'm interested in at the moment. They're very broad, obviously, and we can talk about how they relate to different aspects of learning, but the themes are intelligence, autonomy and morality um, and you know there are many different interpretations and uses of all of those words intelligence obviously is commonly following uh, the term artificial these days um, and machines uh, are supposed to have developed or, or be able to learn um, they are also accredited uh, increasingly with some form of autonomy Unfortunately, particularly in the field of war, where lethal autonomous weapon systems uh, appear to be a growing threat. Um, and then if they do actually make decisions, if machines make decisions and, for example, uh, choose to kill or not to kill particular people, what informs those decisions? As human beings, we would have some sense of morals or possibly ethical frameworks that are built on morals. And so how do machines do that. But I'm also interested in set aside the machines in how humans continue to do and fail to do well in in all those three areas, intelligence, autonomy 
and morality, and perhaps the, the word that sums it up and has been a theme in a lot of my work is governance, which is basically how are decisions made, who makes those decisions, and how accountable are they? So as I say, those are very kind of high level themes that, that cut across all, all the stuff I do. I work in very diverse fields, currently working on a, a circular economy project with a manufacturing company. Um, I'm working on the industrial internet of things, uh, which is quite interesting, and placemaking, which is a, um, a, an emerging area, has some links with learning because there are attempts to introduce learning opportunities in public spaces and things like that. So lots of lots of um, variety, um, if that makes sense. Very interesting work that you do. Um, and let's kind of see how you how you came to do that. So I'm going to quote you now, yes, sorry. Mm -hmm. Having moved into comms after a first career in the music industry, it says in your bio, I have a strong interest in the performance element of communication, which is most evident in business storytelling. Now, what I know most about you, Esri, um, is the first part of that story. Um, full disclosure, we were in a couple of bands together back in the olden times. You played the bass, I played the guitar and even sang a bit. But it's great to meet up again after all these years. So can you do a bit of storytelling on your own career journey and fill in the blanks for me, Es? How did you get to be doing what you're doing now? Um, because I carried on playing music after we'd been working together for a little while and gradually decided it wasn't really um, doing what I wanted to do. So um, I went off to Birkbeck, that marvellous institution where you can study for a degree in the evenings. Um, and I, I, I did a degree in humanities, which is a wonderful pick and mix. I call it pick and mix degree with bits of anthropology and sociology and literary criticism and, and what have you. And that was a great experience. And at the same time, um, I got a job in primary research journals. So I, I worked on publishing academic and scholarly journals for about six years. And that led me into um, higher education policy. I worked for an international network of universities uh, as a, as a you know, initially publishing and then various other aspects of communication, public relations, public affairs, marketing, internal comms and so on. Um, and then I went into... Um, a sort of very, again, very eclectic organisation in where, that shared a lot of my interests, but all in one place. And that was the Royal Society of Arts. And I had the great pleasure and privilege of um, running communications for the RSA um, for, again, for about six years, uh, during which period the institution celebrated its 250th anniversary, um, which was a, a marvellous opportunity. You know, you don't often get the chance to work on um, the 250th anniversary. And of course, the RSA um, created public exams for working people in the 19th century, the RSA exam board, although it's been um, absorbed into, I think, uh, a bigger exam board some time ago, it may well be known to people listening who, uh, you know, either taken RSA exams or it's been part of their background. Um, and then I decided after that, that I would try my hand in the big bad corporate world um, and I ran the internal and change communications for a global financial services company, which was interesting because just as I left, the entire global financial services industry collapsed. 2008, the two things are not related, at least not as far as I know. Um, I'm thinking of that shot you get in movies where the, the hero walks away from the, the exploding car, and the explosions exactly, behind yeah. him and he doesn't look back. Yes. In, indeed, I didn't look back, although I did not set off the uh, explosion that wrecked uh, the economy. But um, I then went to an organisation which, again, may be known to people. It was called Lifelong Learning UK. It was a sector skills council responsible for promoting training and development amongst the people who work in the post compulsory education sector. So teachers um, in, in FE colleges, HE lecturers, librarians, archivists, youth workers, Again, quite a funny mixture of people. Um, and it was um, an extremely interesting and at times quite challenging job. Um, and it unfortunately led to the three C's that completely um, turned my life upside down. And that was the election of the coalition government in 2010, which announced a bonfire of quangos. And the sector skills councils were first on the heap. 
So I got mm. made redundant. The second C is I got cancer. So I became extremely mm. ill um, and that didn't help. Uh, and the, the sort of upshooks I survived, obviously, is that um, it led to a big career change. And I went freelance and I started to really try and find things that I really wanted to do. And But in typical fashion, serendipity uh, took me astray and I ended up running an editorial and communications framework for a European Union agency called the European Training Foundation. They're based in Turin and um, they have an unusual remit. Unlike most EU agencies, they work outside the member states, so in the so-called neighbourhood countries. And their role was to promote the reform and improvement of vocational education and training systems in those countries. And it started when the Berlin Wall came down, the former Soviet Union um, countries emerged with education and training systems that were seen as not fit uh, for the 20th century, never mind the 21st. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, there were aspects of their education and training system that perhaps shouldn't have been chucked out quite so quickly. But in any case, um, it was a wonderful opportunity. I spent a lot of time in Turin, also in Brussels, and travelled to some of the neighbourhood countries in um, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, the Balkans, North Africa, and so on. Very, very interesting um, opportunity that led to some other work with EU agencies. Um, but then we got Brexit. And then we had lockdown, uh, which obviously also changed things quite a lot. But in the meantime, I'd also worked um, on quite a big project with the College of Policing in the UK. So the Police Training College. Um, and that was fascinating to see how they go about um, teach, how they how they manage teaching and learning, essentially. It used um, to be called so, Centrex, is it still? Or? No, it was it was um, it was used to be housed in a grand country home called Brands Hill. And people often knew it as Brand Hill, but it was it was part of the uh, and still is a part of the um, the police service. Right. Um, certainly, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, Scotland uh, has their own setup. Interesting. Um, and then I taught public relations and social theory at the University of Greenwich, and that was great fun teaching Foucault and Habermas to first year PR students. <laughs> Led to some interesting conversations. Um, and sort of to bring it up to date, in the last couple of years, I've worked primarily through a business design agency called GW and Co. Um, and we help organisations of all kinds to create positive, lasting change. Um, and that involves all kinds of things. It, it can be a change of brand, but it's often much deeper than that. It's often around learning, um, but informal. Um, and I think that's part of um, a trend that I've seen in organisations that there's been more of a split, there always used to be a bit of a split between the informal and the formal learning opportunities in organisations. And I think that's that's grown even more, partly because of the rise of social media and related digital technologies and, and partly for organisational reasons. So there you are, that's the story. It's a bit of a ramble, but um, it's been it's been quite the journey in some respects. What fascinating CV. One of the things you left out of your CV there was an important role with the Royal Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland. Mm. Uh, and this is what actually made me want to ask you in in the first place. I think you're the right person to ask about this field of academic study that's emerged relatively recently, certainly a long time after I went to university, called digital anthropology. Now, for the benefit of people who don't know about this discipline, can you tell us what it is um, and how its insights are relevant to people in learning, perhaps? I, you know, I feel it's fairly central because I suspect what it's about is how we relate to technology. It is, yeah. It has its roots in, in obviously, the, the very long-standing debates about the nature of technology and our relationship with it. But I think it's worth taking a step back momentarily and saying, well, you know, what's anthropology more broadly? Um, and although I have to add the caveat that, as I said, I studied humanities, there were bits of anthropology in it. I'm not a trained anthropologist, but to borrow a phrase from an anthropologist who I've met recently, I'm anthropologically inclined, which, which I quite like. Um, and in 2018, I went to a conference in Lisbon called Why the World Needs Anthropologists. 
um, because I was aware that there was a growing interest in so-called applied anthropology, the use of anthropological theories essentially to understand industrial processes or policy or other areas. Um, and that's because anthropologists have some theories and some methodologies that are becoming more relevant, more valuable in the, the way that the world has shaped up. Um, the, the event was called Designing the Future. Um, so I thought I would be completely contrarian and entitle my presentation, um, The Future is Dead, Long Live the Future. And um, we were chatting earlier about the um, Future Fest event. And, mm -hmm. and it's one of the many that uh, adverts and festivals and, and cultural activities of all kinds that have been labelled the future is here, the future has happened, the future is now. And of course, there are some very difficult questions that follow from that, again, specifically about autonomy and agency. If the future has happened, how can we change it? Um, and that's something that anthropologists are interested in. Um, but the um, growing interest in, in anthropology, as I said, in, in the digital world in particular, um, is one of the drivers for the emergence of digital anthropology. So all the big um, digital or tech companies, the so-called FANG companies, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, mm -hmm. Netflix, and Google, all hire anthropologists to help them understand, you know, user experience is one area. But increasingly, they, they look at the broader aspects of relationships between people, devices, networks, um, the culture of how we think and behave and express ourselves using those things. Um, and it's emerged as a, as a sort of subfield, if you like, of anthropology in its own right. And typically it focuses on, um, you know, the quest questions like, we talk about the cloud. We say, ah, put my documents in the cloud. Obviously it's a, a metaphor, there's no such thing. All you're doing is storing your documents on somebody else's computer rather than your own. So whose computer is it? Where is it? How is it operated? How are decisions made about what those computers do and don't do? And anthropologists are interested in the consequences. Obviously, that overlaps with political economy, with sociology, with, with other areas. But what I find with anthropology is it takes a broader view. And I think that's particularly important in, in the world that we're in now. So it's not just looking at human-machine um, interactions, but thinking about what that means for us in the next period of our development if we survive as a, as a species. So there's a, a theme of so-called post-humanism that emerges. Is there a genuine shift from humans to machines um, in terms of, as I could say, those things, intelligence and autonomy in particular? And if so, what, does, what are the implications for us? Um, they're also interested in the relationship between people who are outside of the, the dominant narrative about technology. In other words, non-Western cultures and the practices that they bring to the digital world. One small example is the um, growth of the use of smartphones in parts of Africa. Um, it has really exploded in recent years um, and they are pioneering in areas like cryptocurrencies. So mm -hmm. in parts of Africa, there are local cryptocurrencies created and managed entirely on smartphones that are you know people are using to trade and and buy necessities and so on so you know what makes their interactions with the devices the networks and the and the activities different um and where is there an opportunity excuse me an opportunity for their voice to be heard because some of the issues that we're dealing with around you know the toxicity of social media and so on maybe we can learn something from that. So that's the sort of thing that digital anthropologists would be looking at. Um, I thought I'd mention, in case it's of interest, there's um, a center for the study of humans and machines at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. Um, it's not run by an anthropologist. He's a computer scientist, uh, Iad Rachman, his name is, um, but he is widely sort of known as the world's leading anthropologist of artificial intelligence. Um, and, and the Institute, his, the centre that he directs within the Institute looks at all those kinds of issues about morality of machines, machine behaviour, um, you know, the changes to the workplace brought about by increased automation, um, all those sorts of issues that are important to us as people. The way we work has changed and the way we learn is changing too. 
that 70% of organisations don't feel that their learning systems can really cope with all this change. It seems there is a disconnect between what learners need right now and what most learning suites provide. In a new white paper, Ben Betts and I tell the story of how this disconnect happened and lay out a vision of what a modern learning system ought to be and do. It's called Sweet Dreams and you can read it now. Episode sponsor Cornerstone, a leader in adaptive HR software solutions, invites you to attend Cornerstone Convergence on November 16th and 17th with an incredible lineup of speakers focused on helping talent and learning leaders like you to gain the tools to create a better experience for your people. You won't want to miss this all virtual, all free event. Register today at cornerstoneconvergence.com. Let's stick with that topic for, for a second. Um, talking about the interface between humans and machines. This is a really central preoccupation for educators and the people function in general in organizations. Um, and we're in a moment now, um, it, it very much feels we are clearly out of the gee whiz, isn't it great phase with the internet, which any new communications technology, technology goes through. And now well into the, oh my God, it's rotting our brains phase, which every new communications technology always goes through. So we at least in the Western context, I think there's a lot of horror stories about Facebook currently, social media as a promoter of hate speech, conspiracy theories, a corrupter of democracy even, about diminishing attention spans, about depression in kids, the list goes on. So, so these kind of worries around social media seem to be very much kind of what is pre preoccupying uh, the, you know, the public prints, you know, the, the mainstream media at the moment. Um, so in the light of that wider context uh, that digital anthropology looks at, what I think I want to ask you is we're clearly all very worried. Are we worried about the right things? Well, they are worrying things, there's no question. Um, they're not new problems. These are problems, as you say, that have occurred with other technologies and uh, the digital anthropology, um, you know, ha as I said, has its roots in the debates about the nature of technology and its impact on us. Um, however, unfortunately, I have to say that I don't think they're the things that we should really be worrying about, um, because although they have big economic and social impacts at the moment, um, they are, as I said, things that we've dealt with before. There will be you know, regulation, there'll be competition law, there'll be um, consumer pressure, there'll be other ways that those things are changed. And actually, while that's going on, we're not noticing the things that we really should be worried about, um, which, um, in my opinion, can be summed up in a, in a sort of a, a cascade of jargon, you have to forgive me, but it's things like CRISPR, ex utero embryogenesis, femtosecond projection, two photon lithography, and other technologies that are emerging rapidly under the public radar that are much more transformative in terms of their impact. Can we humans. back up there? Um, yeah. for, for those who, who, who aren't aware that it's CRISPR, that's gene editing, isn't it? Exactly. It's, it's yeah. gene editing um, and it, it's part of this explosion in biotech yeah. that okay. um, has led to, for example, the, the, the example that I love to give is um, scientists have completed ex utero embryogenesis in mice. Which was the other thing you mentioned. Artificially yeah. inseminated an artificial womb, grown a baby mouse to full term and given birth to it without any, quote, real mouse mother or mouse father. Hmm. And I don't know, um, wearing my lifelong science fiction devotee hat, I would say mice today, humans in maybe 10, 15 years. Who knows? Um, but the type of changes that we are now capable of implementing to our own biology have put us on the brink of this term speciation, the idea that we will actually diverge as a species. Um, Elon Musk has already experimented with implants in the brains of monkeys. Um, he's obviously rapidly expanding our capability in terms of space travel. Um, and by the way, SpaceX's company have applied to the courts for corporate sovereignty on parts of the moon. 
Well, why would you want corporate sovereignty on the moon? Well, so that you could do ex utero embryogenesis with humans and none of that pesky regulatory or legal interference. So I think, you know, that those things are the things we should be worried about. They do sound like um, I'm quoting the, the, the sort of storylines of science fiction films. And in some respects, that's absolutely true. But um, I think they're going to have a far, far bigger impact in the long run than whether Facebook is a pain in the bum or not. I want to slightly take issue with, with something you said there about the, the, the preoccupations that we currently have with um, social media and uh, hate speech and so on. It, it, it's true that we've been dealing with, with a lot of those issues, such as, you know, conspiracy theories, you know, racism, narratives. That's, that's not new. Uh, network effects aren't necessarily new. We began to get those with railways and electricity. But there mm. is something about the application of network effects to communications where you have a kind of global um, global telegraph where there is no gatekeeper. There, 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 there are no editors. There's no editorial control of this. It's just loads of people all over the world shouting at each other. Isn't there something new about that? I, I, I think it feels new that anybody can just get on Twitter and start kind of sounding off and, and get people with them and rabble rouse and so on. Mm. Um, and it's, it, it, it's seen by some people as being a kind of, a, the, the very technology as being an enabler of populist governments. And we've had a rise of those. Surely there is yes. something new it, about that. What, what's new about it is the scale and the speed. You know the the prince. I mean, you know, rabble well, rouse. Kant says quali quali quantity is quality. I mean that that yeah. that massive acceleration of yeah. scale and speed has produced something new in terms of the the, the way network effects are affecting um, speech and who has a right to speak. Affecting speech in the sense of who's allowed to say what in what context. Yeah, and uh, mm. you, you you hear lots of opinions, which are very interesting. I was listening to a. a on a, on a podcast, The Exponential View, the other day, uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a VC who invests in um, technologies that have network effects, like, you know, obviously kind of social media platforms and so on, but but zeros, though, in, in on those. And he was saying that all networks, when they grow to, to this scale, this sudden rapid growth of scale that um, companies can get nowadays, uh, experience pollution in the same way that we had mm -hmm. industrialization you know, to be created pollution, networks become polluted. And I, I worried about that because when you start thinking about certain people's use of speech as pollution, mm -hmm. you're kind of sort of saying some people have a right to, to speak and others don't. And surely you're no different to, you know, um, people who, 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 who would author in an authoritarian way kind of sense of speech and, and actually there's something quite chilling about speech even if it is hate speech being described as pollution uh, yes I, I think that's an unfortunate way of looking at it i mean it, it, but um again i don't think that's particularly new um and the issue of conspiracy theories is, is a good example because they have a long history um and by the way it's important to separate conspiracies which obviously do occur criminal conspiracies and political conspiracies do happen and conspiracy theories, which is where um, you know things are imagined beyond uh, what anybody actually knows to be true. Um, but we've now evolved into this realm of so-called conspiracism, which is where people's entire worldview is based on conspiracy theories. Everything's a conspiracy theory, um, and you know you only have to um, accept the initial, whether it's vaccines or five G or whatever, and everything falls like dominoes from that. Um, and I don't think that's really a, a network effect. Um, I don't think it's a, a, a product of the speed and scale of, of technological uh, supported communications. It's a failing of human imagination, and human morality. And that's nothing new. Um, you know, the conspiracy theories really originated in the United States in the 18th century. Um, and ironically, it is wonderful because the people who are sort of subscribed to a lot of these conspiracy theories now would generally, um, you know, generalizing, characterize themselves as against the woke.
people who are sort of promoting social justice theories um, and who talk about decolonization. But the actual original conspiracy theories in the 18th century were the American equivalent of decolonizing. They were trying to expunge British influence. And, and a small number of people saw the shadowy hand of British influence behind everything that went wrong. Um, but inevitably, they also then added um, an anti-Semitic twist and said, ah, but the British government is funded by Jews and so on. So all those conspiracy theories um, are old. They've had success in rousing rabbles in large numbers to very devastating effect. Uh, I'm sure you know what I mean. And, and you know, it, it, I think it's something we have to guard against and have to be aware of. Um, but if you're talking about the difference between the impact of that, which is I'm not trivializing it at all, compared to artificial humans born on the moon with chips in their brains who will never actually live on the planet. Hmm. That's why I think that's of a different order of, of transformative potential. But it isn't saying that Elon Musk wants rights on the moon so that he can do those wacky biological experiments. Isn't that a conspiracy theory? Um, no, because I don't think it's secret about it. I think it's quite open about okay. it. I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think it's it's a commercial logic. Uh, he also wants to import um, vast quantities of lithium from the moon for all the electric cars that Tesla are making. But again, it's not a conspiracy. It's just good business sense. You know, he needs more lithium for car batteries. Getting it off the seabed, which is the other main source, is is problematic and environmentally challenging. Get it off the moon. That seems to be actually seems to be easier now. And by the way, once we're there. Uh, we can build a base and have, you know, zero gravity launch capability, which means we can get to Mars a lot easier. And he did say, and I, I love quoting this because I think it's brilliant, Elon Musk said, I want to die on Mars, just not on impact. So I think that, you know, he's put so much of his very considerable wealth and force of personality into that, that, you know, it's it's got a good chance of happening. Um, and it, it, it's, it sounds scary and it sounds maybe um, that we're not in control of it, but we are. We can all influence the way these things turn out. Uh, we have agency. We can imagine different futures uh, if we want them. And I think that's really important to remember. This is heady stuff for a Monday morning. Mm. It is a bit. Yeah. So you mentioned imagination there, what we can imagine. If we can yeah. zoom in on learning for a second, I know imagination is a topic you're keen to discuss in the context of learning. Why do you think imagination especially should be such a focus? I mean, we hear a lot about curiosity and mm. you know other abstract nouns as being yeah. important. Why, why imagination? Curiosity is important. And, and there have been some very interesting attempts. Merck ran a big campaign on curiosity, which you know they used to promote their products, but also to encourage staff learning. Um, it's worth having a look. I think there's still a Microsoft Merck Curiosity program. Um, but for me, imagination is the root of all progress. We can't make things better without imagining them better first. And that's true for science, the arts, um, industry, any aspect. We have to use our imagination. Um, but it is a double-edged sword, of course. And, and you know, this is best probably characterized by the well-known story published by a young girl in 1818 called Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus, in which she imagined the creation of an artificial human from spare parts and a bit of electricity. Um, Mary that, Shelley for non-English quotes. Yes, yes. Um, she was only 18 when she, when she wrote that, which is quite wow. extraordinary because it has dominated narratives about artificial intelligence ever since and will continue to probably for a long time. In, in a similar example, Isaac Asimov, he was a scientist by training, but he imagined robots that were governed by three laws. And his three laws of robotics are still taken seriously by scientists today. Um, and, you know, those things are really powerful and they show what we can do if we imagine things. Um, and obviously the question is then, are we going to be constructive with what we imagine or not? Um, there was a wonderful piece in The New Yorker a couple of years ago by Catherine Schultz, in which she said that one of the stranger aspects of being human is our ability to imagine things that don't exist. Um, and it's easy to see how that works. Controversially, there are some people who would suggest that 
gods and and um, angels and so on are things that don't exist but we've imagined them and they have in turn influenced human uh, development very significantly um but then you know in the more trivial note bigfoot and the Loch Ness monster and fairies and vampires and so on we imagine them but they take on trickle down existence huh trickle down trickle yeah, kind of trickle down <laughs> Yeah, kind of trickle down existence. Um, and um, I'm, I'm going to quote a, a friend of mine, forgive me, she's uh, written a book called the, it's called The Happy Writing Book. Her name is Elise Van Morder. She's a novelist, but she's written this book about writing. And there was a lovely phrase in it where she says, when we write, we do so out of latency, not just meaning. And uh, uh, sorry, not just memory. We do so out of latency means that what we write can become real. Um, so the power of imagination, and I'm not I'm not just seeing it in a determinist way. It's not that everything that you've ever written down is going to it's going to happen. Obviously not. But if we want things to happen, we kind of have to imagine them first. Um, and a good way of expressing the imagination is through literature. Uh, and as I said previously, um, in my opinion, science fiction, or as I prefer to call it, speculative fiction, which is a bit broader. Um, is or certainly has become probably the most powerful and most relevant form right now because of all these technologies that we're talking about. I mean, you know, artificial yeah. intelligence, biotech, and space travel. Up until recently, you would have to go and read science fiction books. Mm. But now I think there's a good example of that with um, William Gibson and uh, cyberspace. Mm. Um, how how he kind of imagined all that. Um, and I was reading an interview with him recently. Uh, there's you know massive insouciance about the way that he came up with the idea. Um, uh, and he doesn't make any big shakes with his kind of predictive power, but it, it was quite extraordinary um, reading that book and then 10 years later seeing it all absolutely happen and come true with sort of second life virtual reality uh, and, and just the phenomenon of, of, of the internet. On the other hand, my personal kind of disappointment with speculative fiction is, and this isn't so much science fiction writers, but um, every kind of male English novelist of my generation, slightly older than you, has seen fit to write a novel about AI. And I think they're all uniformly depressing mm -hmm. in that they're so unimaginative. Yeah. It, AI in these books always takes the, um, uh, takes part of robotics uh, and, and, and a kind of, creature which is humanoid and this idea that AI, AI will always be embodied in an attempt to replicate humanity and that's not what we actually see with AI which is now part of all our lives to varying degrees you know I I used two AIs just this morning in um, transcribing a podcast and um, subtitling a video and it, it's so much part of our lives um, much more sophisticated uses of it happening all the time. And of course, that that's not counting. As soon as I open Google, I'm starting to use AI. And, and yet we kind of continue to think of AI as being something in the future and also somehow um, caught up with uh, an attempt to replicate and, you know, um, uh, to replicate humans. Yes. And, yes. and I find that a kind of ma massive failure of imagination. I, th I think far more... Scary things happen when you have AI starting to take over that that doesn't go by any kind of human logic. Like you know, who is controlling the financial system? Well, it's in the hands of AI. Interesting metaphor. It's in the hands of AI, and that these are disembodied. Uh, exactly. I mean, so yeah. language makes it so difficult to. Um, it is you know. exactly, and and that's why it's difficult to imagine um, artificial intelligence other than in the form of human intelligence. Um, mm. That's why it's so difficult, and, and this is where science fiction writers have often fallen down in imagining extraterrestrial life that doesn't walk on two legs and speak with an American accent. You know, it's 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 a it's a big challenge, but um, but we are capable of it. And the difference, I think, also between AI and AGI, obviously, is much discussed. The things that machine learning and neural networks and so on are doing now are, are nowhere near general intelligence, artificial general intelligence. But we have this urge to make something that replicates ourselves. And um, in the robot industry, you know, the ultra realistic robots, as they're called, that are popular in Japan, um, do look astonishingly human now. I mean, they've really 
perfected the skin and the, the hair and the movement of the face and so on. Um, it's, it, we seem to be driven to want to do that, uh, although it, it could well turn out to be a complete you know, dead end eventually. Um, but it's understandable. But again, it's um, the opportunity for us is to apply our imagination in different ways. Um, because, you know, as you said, the, the recent spate of novels about AI are not that inspiring. Um, it was a, an 18 year old girl in the 18th century who wrote the most inspiring and, and influential. Um, and that's one of the great things about the science fiction community, readers and writers, it has become incredibly diverse in recent years. Um, and that has added a huge impetus to the quality and, and breadth of imagination that, that's coming out of it. But it's not, you know, it's not, I, I wanted to make the point that it's not really about a predictive capability, um, mm -hmm. that, that science fiction is, is important. There was an article in, of all places, Harvard Business Review, I think in 2018, by a science fiction writer called Elliot Pepper, uh, which was entitled, Why Business Leaders Need to Read More Science Fiction. And his argument was that it enables people to reframe questions, particularly things that are stuck or appear intractable or that have dragged on for ages, um, by give, just giving them a twist. Um, and there have been some very interesting projects that have put business leaders, science fiction writers, anthropologists, policymakers together to say, OK, um, how is, you know, for example, the development of virtual personal assistance going to pan out. Um, and you saw, I don't know if you saw the film Her with Joaquin Phoenix, where he falls in love with his digital um, personal assistant played by Scarlett Johansson, who never actually appears on the screen. But, you know, that, I bailed. That's... I bailed halfway through. I'm Did sorry you? to say, okay. I thought this is, you know, I, I, it, it, it's a kind of personal obsession. But I think that so many people when they when they look at AI just have two narratives. One is Frankenstein by Mary mm -hmm. Shelley. And the other is build your own girlfriend. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I thought this is another male fantasy, and I'm yes, yeah. I switched over. <laughs> yeah, which uh, I, I I I agree. I think you're right, but I think it's you know, as I say, it's indicative of the sort of situation that, in, in a way, it's it's moving closer and closer to what um, a lot of businesses have been doing really since the late '60s and early '70s, the so-called scenario planning. Um, and this was touted as this great business capability, this foresight. You, can, you can't predict the future, but you can see how different situations would play out. And obviously that's very similar to speculative fiction mm -hmm. in a number of ways, and, and, and has, they've increasingly merged. Um, but it's neither a good thing nor a bad thing. It, it's, it's all a question of how people choose to make use of it. Can we um, turn now to talk about the strange science fiction movie we've all been living in the last couple of years? It, mm. it might seem strange to introduce this question at such a late stage of the interview, mm. but um, we've been going through this ongoing pandemic crisis and still going through it, which drove a lot of learning and communication online. Um, in fact, all learning <laughs> went online for a, a period. What tendencies and trends in human machine interaction do you think COVID might have accelerated over these years? And maybe what others has it slowed down? Yeah, I think it it, it was, certainly was a very strange experience. Um, it's possibly again, you know, taken on too big a proportion in our minds if we think about the climate crisis and the destruction of biodiversity, but nevertheless, we will, mm -hmm. Um, understandably focus on COVID for some time to come, but it, its effects, I think, were contradictory. Obviously, it accelerated people's familiarity with video conferencing uh, technology, um, for mostly Zoom, but others as well. Um, and just as an aside, I was in the um, attic a while ago and found a box of old communication industry magazines, like business communications, not telecoms and so on, but business communications and the, the, there was one dating I think April 2001 um, and the cover story was this internet thing means we can work from anywhere and it had this <laughs> illustration on the cover of computers in all these different places all zapping into this building to represent the office yeah so again you know it was like great it took 20 something years in a global pandemic but okay it accelerated our uptake of, of those kinds of technologies 
but it also slowed down real engagement with what happens in those interactions, I think. And um, I'm sure that one of the challenges people who are designing and implementing learning programs is to shift them back into the real world as part of something, you know, that people value and, and can make good use of and away from the, what's become this kind of mind-sucking ephemera that, that dominates a lot of um, online interactions and, and digital anthropologists would no doubt have something to say about that. Mm -hmm. um, it did also accelerate, obviously, global digital connections or an awareness of them. It made us all think, oh, you know, I can chat to my friend in LA or, you know, Bogota or wherever it happens to be. Um, and I may be slightly biased by personal experience, but I think it also slowed down or even reversed our ability to manage ordinary everyday relationships in the real world. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the consequences, I think, have been contradictory uh, from a learning perspective, useful in that it, it may have broken down some of the remaining, um, you know, resistance to using digital technology for teaching and learning. Um, there is a whole depth of research on learning outcomes and learning design using both pure technology, digital technologies and also so-called hybrid, which is now top of mind in, in the business world, hybrid offices and so on. Um, but for students in all kinds of settings, in work-based learning or in um, educational institutions, that's been a reality for some time and the balance has simply shifted. So I think that's, that's all valuable. Um, but I do worry that, um, you know, it's become part of this really unreal, you know, Netflix. It's like Netflix. If it isn't, and if so, therefore, if it isn't making your heart pound for 10 seconds or, you know, having that kind of very entertainment-oriented impact on you, it's not, it's not worth it and, and people just turn away. Hmm. You mentioned an uh, um, interesting word there, hybrid. Um, which is um, prompting me to ask a question that um, I certainly hadn't alerted you to because it's only just come in, popped into my mind. But a lot of people in the L&D space now are um, addressing this thing of hybrid working because there is a feeling that um, the pandemic will have a long tail and there may well be another one around the corner a few in a few years' time. So hybrid working looks like something that we're all going to have to to learn how to do. Do you have any views on hybridity because you know th this interface between humans and digital technology is very mm. much your thing well again it's it's a concept borrowed from biology and which is interesting in itself it's uh, you know originally meant the splicing together of genes in different species to create uh, something more useful for for humans but um, ah. it's it's a bit of a misnomer because um it's more about status it's more about power and hierarchies than it is about technology. Um, all the debates about who should go to the office and when and what days. And it's also still sadly framed by a 19th century factory model for work. You know, all our work is conceived of as being done in factory type blocks um, and managers are conceived of as people who supervise production lines. Um, and a lot of the urge to return to or to get people back to the office is to reinstate that because there's such a deep rooted fear that people who are not being supervised in that way. And let's set aside the question of software that tracks their keyboard clicks remotely for the time being. But if they're not being directly supervised in that way, obviously, they're not going to work, are they? because everybody gets up every day and thinks, gosh, how can I avoid doing my job? So, well, no. And, and I think that it puts, again, the focus on um, some older, more difficult, but really significant issues around trust and around power and around how we organize work when the technology, the technology can enable us to do pretty much whatever we want. And obviously we're really confining these comments to the advanced industrial economies and, and other, some other bits of the world. Uh, and to people who use computers constantly at work, bus drivers are different. You know, here in Brighton at the moment, we have a strike of dustbin uh, collection drivers and the rubbish is piling up and the rats are coming out <laughs> in great numbers. So that sort of um, takes the shine off our techno-futurist world a little bit. Um, 
so yeah i think it's hybrid is is just a buzzword that has taken hold at the moment um, rather than uh, a useful way of thinking about how we can organize work and learning um, i think we have the technology to do as i say pretty much whatever we want the question is what do we want i think that's a good note to end it on um, I think you've had a fascinating career and you've got a lot of ideas and there is a ton more questions that I could ask you but I think for, for this episode of the podcast I just have to say thank you very much Esri Collaback. Thank you John it's been an absolute pleasure. That's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time many thanks to Esri thanks to our sponsors Learning Pool and welcome to new sponsors Cornerstone On Demand. The Learning Hack is completely independent and transparently funded by sponsorship. If you want to help others find us, please like, follow, rate, review and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice or on YouTube. Next week, there'll be a new episode of Great Minds on Learning. This one's about the moralists. Maslow, Kohlberg, Clark, no relation, Martin, McLuhan and Postman. Till next time. Stay curious, learning people. Now I finally get it. Is that, is that <laughs> 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 <laughs>